All right, gentlemen, looking good. Uh, we're ready to start the van. How about you? We are ready. All right. KTRK TV, this is Mission Control Houston. You can now call station for a voice check. Thanks, Butch. Station, this is KTRK Ted Oberg. How do you hear me? Ted, we have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as a as an opener, maybe a softball. Is it is it lonely now uh, without the shuttle crew and after watching them leave? Yeah, I'll give I'll give the mic mic the softball. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ted. It, it certainly got a lot quieter. Uh, they were they were up here. They were a crew of four, but it really seemed like a crew of uh, eight to ten uh, because they worked like that. And it was uh, it was gangbusters here for the entire time they were here. It was great having them here, and it did get a lot quieter. Um, and uh, and we have a little less room after they left. I assume all stuff you need, though, right? I mean, you haven't eaten all that food, have you? I, I, I believe right now they tell us we have about a year's worth of food on board. So, no, it'll take us a while to gnaw through that. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you excited about the prospect of these commercial ships coming up towards the end of the year? Or at all nervous about this new technology, you know, getting so close? Well, new technology like this, new ships are always exciting. They really are. I think uh, Ron and I are both a little disappointed that we won't be here to uh, to greet the first ones of the uh, the new uh, generation of ships, if you will. So we're excited about the prospects. Uh, there's a lot of people across the country, you know, with the different teams working really hard. We're excited about it. Uh, I wouldn't say nervous is is a player, but you know, you need to pay close attention to the details and make sure they're ready to uh, come aboard because it's it's really tough. That's tricky business to come up close and hover and then reach out and grab it with the arm. You have to get it all right. And, and are you confident that commercial crews can do that? Well, the first step is commercial cargo ships, and that, that's on the, on the near-term horizon. We're going to see the first of those arrive here within about five months or so, uh, schedules, uh, you know, as schedules go. And for the cargo ships, they'll come up and do very similar to what the uh, Japanese HTV did, come up and basically hover underneath the space station where we'll reach out and grab it with the arm. And we've done that twice with the uh, Japanese cargo ship. Uh, and so the, uh, the new ones that are coming up will use that same technique at first. And that's different than bringing up a crewed vehicle with people on board and accomplishing a docking. Let me switch gears a little bit. I think one of the things that we talked about uh, as, uh, as the shuttle's final flight was coming on is the, now that we turned all of our attention to the space station, the number of hours that you guys spend doing science versus the number of hours doing tasks is uh, maybe lopsided. How, how do you look at that, and how can we get more time for you guys to do more science? Well, I think it was lopsided when we had a crew of three and we, when we were right in the heart of the construction. I mean, most of the activities during that time period was building this amazing orbital research facility, and that's what this is, a research facility. And right now we're in the full utilization role. And, um, you know, even though, you know, we've been building this place for the last 10 years, we still managed to conduct over 600 experiments during that time, and we've had some uh, really uh, good breakthroughs uh, in the science that we've conducted up here. We are doing a minimum of 35 hours a week right now of science. Uh, we're, we're actually doing more than that, uh, but that's what we are set uh, uh, as, a, as a goal, uh, that we want to do at least that. And uh, I think we're, we're far ex exceeding that. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to reap the ven benefits uh, of our, our labor up here, of, of everybody's labor, to build this place. And we are going to see a return on investment. And I think uh, history is going to show that this place was an amazing investment because uh, we are going to see vast improvements uh, in life on Earth and, uh, and, and vast improvements in our ability to explore the solar system because of the discoveries uh, that are going to be made possible from the research that's being conducted on board. board. But, but as scientists yourselves, is, is, it, is 36 hours enough? Is 70 hours enough? I mean, wh where should we, where should that goal be? 
Yeah, when I said 35 hours as a goal, that is crew time. So there's a lot of experimentation that's going 24-7. Uh, you know, we might just flip a switch and get it started. We might uh, put some samples in and, and get it going. But the, the, but the science is, is going uh, on all the time in, in a lot of these facilities. And so we need to increase that. We need to increase the utilization. Uh, not all experiments need crew interaction. Uh, those that do, uh, we're devoting at least 35 hours to right now, and we want to devote as much time as we possibly can to that. Cool. And, and let me switch gears again. As we look at longer and longer flights in space, either on ISS uh, or to the moon or off and, and beyond to, that, to, to other uh, options, tell me about your health concerns. What has NASA told you to be worried about or to, or to monitor, and what are the changes you notice after an extended time in space? I'll take that, Ted. I, you know, I have not personally noticed anything beyond the first, um, the first adaptation than when you come up here. The fluid shift causes, which is real common, and you see that, of course, even on the, a short duration shuttle mission. Uh, the fluid shift causes a, basically a pressure in the head. It's kind of like if you're hanging by your knees from a, a monkey, monkey bars and the blood flows to your head and, it, and uh, you get kind of a sinus headache. Uh, that dissipates as your body adjusts to those kind of things. Uh, and the, all the body systems kind of adjust. Right now, I, I feel, you know, just, I, I feel no different. Um, the, 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 the real test is in the details, and we were tested a lot for the bone density and uh, muscle density, uh, you know, including I had muscle biopsies before I flew, so they can measure me before and after the flight, all the way down to the enzyme levels and the, and the, the cellular levels on me. And so that's, that's where the test really comes from. We don't really notice it up here, but you want to see. And there's, there's a lot of things we're doing with exercise regimen, with uh, medis medications to minimize uh, bone loss, uh, muscle uh, atrophy, and other possible uh, uh, you know, uh, negative side effects of zero G. And it's not bad for six months. Uh, it, it could become more significant if you're making an eight-month one-way trip to Mars, and then you need to be healthy enough to get out and get some work done and uh, get home for another, you know, roughly eight-month trip on the way home. So we're learning it now in, in uh, steps that are, I think are uh, quite reasonable, and they're getting as much out of us, us uh, human guinea pigs as they can. Got it. My time is almost up. But any changes to your eyesight at all? Uh, we, I, we have not uh, experienced anything like that. We're, everybody's uh, watching close. Uh, eyes are one of the things that can be affected by the uh, space, and we're not completely sure why, so we're watching it closely. No pun intended. And, and guys, it's always a thrill to talk to you. I, I'm curious, and I don't expect you to zoom out the camera, but are you sitting or standing or just free-floating? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, it's one of those questions uh, that's better left that, unanswered. I hope that you answered your question. All right. Take care. Be Thanks, safe. Thanks, Ted. It was great talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KTRK TV portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from KTRH Radio. Station, this is KTRH Radio. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. How about us? You, sound great. You guys sound terrific. Thanks. It's good to, good to talk to you. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. It is Matt Patrick and Lois Melkonian from KTRH in Houston. First thing we want to say is go Aggies. I understand we have quite a connection. Oh, we've got the Aggie connection going up here for sure. I, of course, am an Aggie grad and an Aggie dad, and uh, Ron Guerin is an Aggie dad himself. So uh, you know, we've got all kind of Aggie spirit up here. <laughs> How much Aggie clothing did you bring with you up to the space station? Oh, boy, that is really a loaded question. I, I, there happens to be a lot of maroon in my clothing selection. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mike Foss and Ron Guerin, it, uh, it is a great to talk with you guys. Listen, is there a different mood uh, on board right now uh, with the U.S. Uh, space flight, uh, the shuttle flights uh, on hold, uh, and, and the next flight not coming in uh, for a couple of years? Is, is there a different kind of a mood? And, of course, you've got the folks in, in, in Clear Lake that are, uh, you know, a, a little, uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess the, the, the mood is a little more somber. Do you feel that there, or are you looking forward to the days ahead? Well, well, yes to both questions. Uh, we definitely feel it up here. This is a, a very difficult, challenging transition period for not only us as a nation, uh, but also our entire the entire international sp uh, space program, space station program, uh, and then you know particularly felt in those places around the country that uh, are involved in the space program, like Clear Lake. Um, so you know. <laughs> It, it, there's a lot of feelings involved. That there's a lot of uh, things to think about on that. You know, um, you know the way we like to look at it, though, is that you know we're closing the chapter on one, on one part of our history, um, but we're opening up a new chapter. Uh, it's going to take us a little bit of while, you know, a little while though, to get going in this new chapter. This new chapter will hopefully see us leaving low Earth orbit and and starting to really explore the solar system. Uh, and I and I think and I hope that uh, Clear Lake is going to be a big part of that. But you know, we recognize that there's a lot of people that uh, are, you know, really going through some tough times be because of this. And, uh, you know, I just hope everybody realizes all those people that uh, uh, are having to find other, uh, you know, making career changes right now because of the transition that we have in the space program, what a tremendous contribution and how important their contribution has been uh, that they've made uh, so far. Because, you know, I truly believe that, you know, history will look at this International Space Station and it will see uh, not only did it allow us to, to take that next step, and go explore the solar system, but it also made a really big difference, a really big positive impact on uh, the improve, you know, just improving life on Earth. And, and I think it's something to really be proud of, and we are really proud of all those people that are involved in that. Ron Guerin, Mike Fossum, as you look at Expedition 28, and you're represented by the U.S., by Russia, by Japan, what is it like in the space station in terms of just language issues, relational issues? Yeah, Lois, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, not only is this place, you know, the stepping stone to exploration beyond the, the, the low Earth orbit, not only is it going to make life better on planet Earth, it, it's also a shining example of international cooperation. Uh, it really is. It's, it's amazing to see what, what this international partnership has accomplished up here on orbit and to think that if we can do this on orbit, you know, imagine what we can do to solve the problems facing our planet. But, you know, on board, we're an international crew. Um, we primarily speak English. However, uh, we, we do speak Russian uh, to our Russian crewmates, to uh, mi the mission control in, in Moscow. Uh, we have a Japanese uh, crewmate uh, with us on board, and he uh, occasionally, if he, if he needs to, for technical reasons, he'll speak Japanese to the control center in Japan. Uh, and that's, this is the wave of the future. We are, um, you know, I, I think we're going to be able to do great things working together as an international partnership. And I I think Mike wants to add some words to that. No? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's, uh, that, you know, it's, a, it's really a neat place to work. It's, a, it's a, you know, great to be part of this uh, international uh, partnership. Mike Fossum, uh, Ron Guerin, uh, astronauts uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, that's who we're speaking with here this morning. Uh, gentlemen, is there is there ever a time when you can find some privacy? I would assume at some point uh, maybe you just kind of need to go off somewhere and read or just kind of be by yourself. Is there anywhere on the space station where you can kind of be alone and just maybe think? Yeah, this is Mike with you. I think for me, the favorite, my favorite place to go is a little cluster of windows. It's on the bottom part of the space station, and we affectionately call it the cupola. Uh, it's a fairly late addition to the space station. It was not here the last times I've been here, but it is a marvelous just view of not just the world, the Earth as it's rolling by at five miles a second, but it's also really neat to be able to see the stars because we have kind of a sideways view out of this cluster of windows. So you can see the stars hanging above the Earth. Uh, this morning I got up early and uh, went to take a look and there was the Aurora Borealis kind of shimmering in the distance. And that was a really neat time to just uh, 
you know, relax a little bit. I had a little bag of coffee with me and, you know, kind of collect my thoughts and get ready for the day. Now, who else carries a bag of coffee instead of a cup? Mike, thanks so much for that. Mike and Ron, we're talking to you. We understand you're quite the spacewalk team. How do you become a spacewalk team? Hey, I think uh, for us, it's uh, just a, a lot of hard work and even more uh, good luck. We flew together on STS-124 three years ago, and actually we're standing in the uh, Japanese laboratory right now, and Ron and I did the spacewalks associated with adding this laboratory to the complex up here. So we did three spacewalks with 124, and then uh, shortly after we uh, got back home, Ron got into the space station training flow, and then I was lucky enough to join him a few months later, and as luck has it, we're here together, and they needed a little work done. So uh, they, knew, they knew who to call. <laughs> and uh, as we said, uh, we put, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> All right. Well, that leads me then to my next question, which I didn't know if I was going to ask or not. But I watched the Peter Frampton video, <laughs> and uh, Ron, I saw you, uh, you, you know, talking with Peter Frampton, who I, I uh, have met on a few occasions. Nice guy. And uh, you said that you did bring uh, Frampton Cousins alive uh, up to the International Space Station. I'm going to call you on that right now. <laughs> Is that indeed true, or were you just uh, kind of placating Peter Frampton and that San Francisco audience? No, it is, it is definitely true. And as a matter of fact, in that clip, he showed a picture of that CD uh, on, in orbit. And, and you know, it, music is a really uh, interesting thing to talk about up here because this is a very sterile environment. All you hear is, you know, pumps and fans. And, and you know, it's really, really nice to be able to listen to music because, you know, it really gives you a, a connection uh, t to your home planet, if you will. I mean, it really is a, is a nice connection. And it's really uh, surreal, if you, uh, you know, to think... Uh, about you know looking at the earth and, and seeing this beautiful planet while you're listening to beautiful music and, and have that connection with with the earth it, it's really uh, you know almost indescribable you know how do each of you think of the, and this is a you know, how do each of you think of Sorry. Yeah, I, this is Mike. I just have to add, you know, we, we do have a, an assortment of music. Yesterday was Stephen Curtis Chapman Day because he was in Mission Control and uh, got to talk to us. Other days are ZZ Top Day, and, uh, and we're, uh, you know, rocking the station. So we enjoy music as a way to help pass the time and have a little fun. I know we have to wrap this up, but I've got to ask what you think of yourselves. I know you've called yourselves human guinea pigs, and, and you're working on the human body, biology, physics, materials. You're doing cutting-edge experiments that will really I influence many of us for years and decades to come. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's part of the reason why we do what we do here. We, we realize that... You know, this is a this is an opportunity for us as not just the nation, but us as 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 a species, as humanity, to to improve our lot, to improve our planet, to improve our, our the way we live. Uh, there's experiments that we're doing on board that I think will lead to better ways to provide clean water, uh, better uh, food, better medicines, better materials. The list goes on and on. And, and to be a part of that, and to be working with all those thousands of people, not just across the the, the nation, but across the around the world, to to basically th this is a pretty, you know, important, pretty. This is a pretty big deal. This is this is something that's going to change the world. And to be a part of that is is just an absolute honor. And if that means that sometimes we got to donate some of our blood to and throw it in the freezer for, for evaluation back on the earth, and that's a small price to pay because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really an honor and a privilege to do this. Mike Fawson, Ron Guerin, thank you so much for the time from the International Space Station. From all of us here at KTRH, back on earth, have a safe trip home. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Lois. It was great talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.